place and go time here for this webinar. Uh, we're going to do as it says uh, fluoroquinolone toxicity and uh, more importantly treatment considerations because I think we all at this point are pretty aware how toxic uh, those drug class can be. Um, certainly not universally but interestingly uh, I think it's being reported more now so there's that. So we want to talk a bit about what makes it so toxic and we're not going to go down too many rabbit holes there but I picked the most interesting and probably the most treatable rabbit holes and I don't want to spend the bulk of the time on uh, therapies uh, and what I've seen over time as uh, you know as far as things that work and strategies that work etc <clears throat> so this is important uh, especially for people in certain states like Hawaii and California and some of the other ones that have uh, more strict regulations starting with our first webinar of this year so January and February and then this one and on forward from here to eternity or whenever we <laughs> The A and P and I break up, um, which has happened before. Um, we're going to have uh, uh, we're going to pay ahead of time to have A and P accredit uh, the webinars, and uh, so that means that uh, every uh, state in the U.S. except for Oregon can claim A and P accreditation. We're still going to try and work with Oregon, which we, we did for all the other ones, and get that as well. But AANP covers pretty much everybody else, at least uh, in, in the U.S. In Canada, we're still kind of working on things, so uh, hold that thought. The last, the, actually the next to the last slide, so the last slide always says thank you, because thank you for coming. But the next to the last slide is your CE certificate, and it actually, these will all have the, the clock hours. Uh, for total CE and then how much of that was pharmacology and because this is about a drug toxicity and treatment for example this will all be pharmacology credit uh, and so we've been working uh, closely with AAMP CE folks and uh, we're we're going to pay them uh, whatever they ask to grant the CE and it, it's also just a way to be supportive of AAMP uh, as opposed to going to some other outlet to get the CE, you know, credited. So that's what we're doing. Uh, for those of you in certain states like Washington, you just have to have a record that you uh, took this and that it had something to do with uh, clinical practice. But as I said, places like Hawaii, California, et cetera, need you know, pre-approval and all that. One thing I would say if you're in California, and I think Hawaii as well, in California, you can claim up to 15 hours of AAMP accredited recorded webinars. If you're listening live, you can claim all of them uh, because it's live uh, live feed webinar. So you need to keep track of that yourself. We're, we're not going to keep track of that. But anyway, this is exciting. Uh, it's costing uh, a big chunk of money, but uh, it's just it's just, I, I understand what it's like to be in a state where you've got. You know, a lot of specific uh, regs. We could add probably Arizona and a few of the other ones. So here you go. Uh, no conflict of interest. I have no stock in fluoroquinolones or anything else I'm going to talk to you about tonight. Um, here's our next uh, webinar. So we've got three more with titles. Uh, so April 17th. Uh, so all of these are the third Tuesday of the month at 530 Pacific unless there's an asterisk by it. And the reason there's asterisk by certain ones is we had to change the dates. But April 17th, we've got nutrient absorption. We're going to talk a lot about, uh, you know, not just the mechanics of where and how, but uh, what are things and what are comorbidities that will decrease that, what are things that we can do to increase it, et cetera. Um, May 15th, again, the third week, we're going to talk about uh, dysautonomia and EDS complex EDS is uh, no longer just one uh, disease it's a whole bunch of them and then June 12th which is a week early <clears throat> we're going to talk about low dose immunotherapy and the reason we're doing that is, is that uh, Lori and my 35th anniversary is the week after and I, I uh, would 
prefer to be with her. And so we'll get this uh, recorded a week early for you. It'll be live that day. July, August, we'll get t- topics for you, regular dates. September is uh, a week early because of another commitment. October, November, December, we'll get topics, and they're all on the third Tuesday. So there you go. That's the layout for the year. Believe it or not, this is the 38th of these, and we've got a few others uh, that actually aren't even on here that are in the uh, in the webinar uh, log or history. So we're, we're building up a pretty good bunch. Um, one of the things that, uh, as we go forward, probably later in 2018, we're going to be having some non uh, uh, non monthly webinar additional CE that we will also get pre-approved for credit. These will be a little bit maybe longer uh, uh, chunks of things, for instance, you know, three, four hours in emergency medicine or, you know, X number of hours in an advanced genomic topic or something like that. So for that coming. But the topic of the day here is uh, fluoroquinolone toxicity. And you know, this is something that's certainly not new, but it became when fluoroquinolones got a black box warning about Achilles tendon rupture. And uh, for those of you that might remember, you know, the days of the clinical board reviews, that was always one that we emphasized because you know, a lot of times on the clinical boards, they, they like you to know the black box stuff. Uh, so uh, that was sort of, uh, that was the common thing. But what those of us who would kind of watch fluoroquinolones uh, were noticing was, in addition to Achilles tendon rupture, which certainly did happen, we would have people with tendinoses, tendinopathies, just general musculoskeletal pain, all kinds of stuff, and it would be after fluoroquinolones, and in, in the early days, we would kind of blame it on maybe there was some, you know, synovial and they got killed or there was other stuff because fluoroquinolones are very, very broad spectrum. They have a lot of, uh, you know, very potent pharmacology. And so, you know, you know, God knows why they were doing what they were doing and patients would get the infections. Now, I'm, I didn't put a whole lot in here that's, that's in really the, you know, kind of the top line stuff that you see on the fluoroquinolone websites or on the FQ pharmacology pages such as you know, they'll be a little bit later on, but, you know, people who are sick, older people, sicker people, all that are more likely to have these problems. But that's very true. Uh, if you look over time, uh, and, uh, you know, I've, I've been around prescribing these things since they first came out pretty much. And, um, you know, we, we didn't traditionally have tons and tons of problems with them across the board. Um but what we did notice over time is those those of us, uh, unlike myself, I was always extremely judicious with fluoroquinolones because they were kind of your quarter of last resort for a lot of uh, infectious things. I wasn't using oddly on everybody for every purpose under the sun, and uh, certainly that you know changed over time. Uh, so I think that uh, this collusion of more people getting fluoroquinolones, more sick people getting fluoroquinolones, and all of this stuff, um, you know, kind of all came together with uh, numbers of prescriptions written, broader base of prescribing, more patient exposure over time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we started seeing not just Achilles tendon rupture, but all sorts of other problems. And then it, you know, went from the orthopedic region of side effects to you know, neurological and psychiatric and, uh, you know, and mitochondrial and all kinds of other stuff. And then it was like, well, what in the world is going on? Uh, and, and that's a very, very good question. So we should probably start there. Yeah. This 2010 paper that I have lifted these quotes out of, uh, there, there's a, a citation you know, in the fourth. I think there's four slides here from it. But from 2010, you know, so I mean, that's it's seven to eight years old at this point. It brings up some really important things because it's a really good summary paper. If you want to go back and read it, and there's there's certainly been some things since then. But th- this kind of gets to it. So 
If you remember, uh, so FQ fluoro fluoroquinolones, uh, and it, their statement is the exact pathophysiology of FQ induced tendinopathy remains elusive. Some concepts have been suggested. And I want to talk about these and what we found out in the last, you know, six, seven, eight years since uh, this was written. Now, we've always known, really, since the first fluoroquinolone, that this is a bacterial DNA inhibitor. So it inhibits a gyrase and blah, blah, blah. Well, here's the thing. If you can do that, you can get in and you can slow down or stop uh, the replication of bacteria. Now, they make the statement, and this is the statement we were all going with in the pharmacology world. If you go down a few sentences, theoretically, fluoroquinone should not exert negative effect on human cell lines. Because affected bacterial enzymes have little homology with mammalian DNA. Now, here's the problem. Um, that's true, but it didn't turn out to work that way. Now, there's other reasons why these drugs will affect humans uh, as well as bacteria. But the first thing that you want to think about, and um, for, you know, if you had me as a pharmacology teacher, or if you did the reviews with me, and, and you were you know, um, masochistic enough to remember all that stuff. One of the things that I used to say when we talk about these types of drugs is the more broad spectrum, and, and the fluoroquinones, the, their upside is their super broad spectrum, and really actually wonderful you know, efficacy drugs for many, many infections. The more broad spectrum a drug is, usually that means it has a uh, a far-reaching mechanism of action, and here's the thing. The first mechanism of action that is identified is often only one of many, and the side effects come from usually the all, you know, all the mechanisms that we may not even know about. So one of the things that we used to talk about, and this paper actually brings up is, so in the, like in the board reviews or in the farm class or whatever, we would talk about this and say, it's not really that far of a stretch to say something that's a DNA interrupting drug that works as well as this does. And I want to make that point because there's a lot of other antibiotics and other anti-infective drugs that you know, do stuff with DNA or maybe uh, you know transcriptase or other stuff like that, but they don't do it very well, and that's why they're not super broad spectrum. Whereas this this class of drugs really works well, etc. So while the, our original theories, and that this is the theory, uh, was that the bacterial DNA uh, inhibition is uh, is so different from human, we don't see a crossover. Well, guess what? <laughs> we do. And here's the next thing, and they bring it up in an upcoming slide, is think about the slowest to heal tissue pretty much in the body. It's usually connected tissue. You know, like when you get a bone bruise or you get a tendinopathy or something like that. I mean, it, it's like glacial healing. So if that's the area that we interrupt uh, with this, um, then the repair and the turnover is going to be super duper slow, too. So it's not like that's the only place it can get affected. But that's why we saw the original problems in Achilles tendon rupture and then tendinopathies and tendinoses. Um Animal studies, and this is something that, again, we would always, you know, point out in boards and stuff like that, that they're contraindicating children. Here's the other thing that it shows. So it may damage juvenile weight-bearing joints. The other thing is, if you remember back to pharmacology, chloroquinolones have the potential uh, to expedite closure of the epiphyses, and that stops growth. And so this would be another reason it may not be the best for children. Now, I, I have had, you know, doctors call me up and yell at me about, well, it says you can use it in children, you know, in, in this instance. Well, that, that's true. Uh, but for the most part, if a chloroquinone is going to be given to a child, um, you know, unless, unless you have extremely good reasons and coverage and all that stuff, that's usually best left to infectious disease doctor because it probably means there's some sort of infection that there's no other answer for. Uh, and then if they screw the kid up, it's, you know, it's, they're at the top of the food chain. That's going to really happen to them. Also, it's generally contraindicated pregnancy and lactation for the same reason. 
But here's in 2010, they started writing about this next step, which is beyond the DNA gyrase problem. And that is that the fluoroquinolones have chelating properties. Oh, well, this could be a problem. Uh, against several ions such as calcium, magnesium, aluminum. And here's the thing. These guys have the ability to chelate in directions that are very, very pro-inflammatory. So the reactive oxygen activity, et cetera, is kicked up without knowing it. Um, so the thing about this is if I go and I grab onto calcium and magnesium and then I disrupt all of its downstream uh all this downstream physiology, I am going to have downstream effects on stuff like type 1 collagen, et cetera. And so that is also going to more specifically drive the wedge into the connective tissue, which already doesn't feel very well. The next place where they said, oh, wow, this is, you know, this, this molecule does much more than simply uh, interrupt DNA gyrase, which was what it was sold on originally. So again, animal experiments, um, lots of connected tissue problems. You can look in here and read it. And as I said, I'm, I give you the citation for this. If you want to go dig it up, read it. It's from a pharmacology journal, but it's actually quite well written. Um, and their, their statement in that last sentence that I underlined there, under normal circumstances, rate of matrix turnover and, and tendon fibroblast activity is low. So it, what they're saying here is at the very best, we don't heal uh, our uh, <laughs> matrix and connective tissue and especially tendons very well. And then if we cause a pausing of their ability to heal while we're on the drug, we've got kind of double troubles. So then you get weakness. Now, why would it show up in the Achilles tendon first? Well, that's because that's the biggest uh, tendon under the most force. If you combine those two things and you've um, uh, gone and, you know, basically made microscopic necrosis, you're, you're, it's under a lot of pressure. You're, you're likely to pop it. Now, this is another thing, and this is what we focused on if you go back to 2010 and before, uh, because that was, you know, the, the heyday of about uh, 1999, 2000 to 2010 was the Achilles tendon, Black Spot, warning, and all that stuff, I think. Um, and so back then they would say, well, just don't give it to people who are on steroids and, and elderly, all this stuff. And, and, you know, what I would see when people would have reactions is but a lot of them would be elderly, et cetera. Um, and, and so don't give it to people who have other comorbidities, which may cause tendonitis, et cetera, which certainly, you know, is true. I mean, occasionally someone might have to use the fluoroquinolone. Uh, and so it's nice to know that, you know, is there a profile of somebody that, you know, that would be like the person, the last person in the world you want to give it to? Well, the older they are, the sicker they are. If they're on immunosuppressive drugs, especially steroids, but really any immunosuppressive. So you get any of your uh, patients on, uh, you know, rheumatologic immunosuppressants, this is not a good drug to give them. And then the rest you can read there. So you can look into that paper if you want. But I think it's probably one of the nicest big summaries. And then I just want to get into a couple of other things that kind of uh, hopefully are going to, uh, I guess we'll circle back around and we'll see these in respect to uh, uh, how we're going to treat this or why is it so hard to treat. But we're not quite done yet. So what else can get messed up when we're thinking of fluoroquinolones in the body? Um, this is a, a short, but really, really nice slide set from a pharmacologist. You can get it right there. Uh, there's the slide share um, URL, and uh, you can get it. I just borrowed this particular one because it uh, illustrates what we talked about a little bit earlier, and that is that the fluoroquinolone actually is a chelator, and so it goes and it it, it occupies magnesium, like we said, aluminum, calcium, other stuff like that. And so then what happens is that the magnesium is occupied by chelating. We get free radical 
formation and we get these microscopic uh, cartilaginous lesions. Now this is this is a hypothesis, just like the DNA gyrase thing, et cetera. But if you put them all together and you look at how much people react horribly to uh, the fluoroquinolones, this actually makes a lot of sense. It's probably more than one reason for the reaction, and it probably includes a lot of microscopic damage, and that would this would make total sense. And they go down, I think, in the third. Uh, the you know, second, third bullet points there talking about just we already know that when we have an osseous injury or we have a, a connective tissue injury, especially, we wind up with extreme slow turnover of cells. And so if we damage those cells without an injury, like with the drug, it's going to take forever to heal back up. And that's why they break down and they have all these problems. So, um, again, if you want to, you know, a really succinct uh pathophysiology look from a pharmacologist's point of view. This, I think, 13, 14 slides, they do a great job there. Now, they still kind of end with the idea that, well, these are these are still kind of safe drugs, and if you just don't give them to old people or people with immune problems, you'll be fine. And I would say that that's not a universally held belief anymore. Now, this actually comes from... Uh, one of my favorites, the Journal of Hazardous Materials. Um, and this is looking at fluoroquinolones as a, uh, a, actually as a pollutant. But it goes through the chemistry and illustrates this chelating effect and the, the reactive oxygen effect that fluoroquinolones have probably better than anything else. So while they're really looking at it as a pollutant in wastewater, which of course it is, uh, this stuff goes on inside your body. So what's happening there? Well, this is from uh, this is from their paper journal has that, um, and essentially it's just um, showing that the fluoroquinone itself can become a hyperoxidant, and um, that is usually mediated via metals such as all ROSR. Here's another thing then to consider uh, when we're thinking about comorbidity and treatment and other stuff. What if a person, you know, has a moderate uh, body burden or they or they've mobilized the body burden of metals, um, or let's say they have hemochromatosis or high copper or some other problem? Well, they're going to naturally become more of a, a reactive oxygen generator in the presence of the fluoroquinolone, because this would happen inside of you as well as inside of wastewater, et cetera. So I think that that's really important. And we see the big ones uh, like sulfation, iron, uh, manganese, you know, all of the copper could be on here, et cetera. Anything that can flip electrons around the fluoroquinolones become very poisonous in the face of. And this is something if you get the more advanced fluoroquinolone toxic person, and um, you know you will if you haven't already, their central nervous system, well, the peripheral nervous system, but their central nervous system especially is in bad, bad shape. And the reason is is that fluoroquinolones also affect the central nervous system in ways that are kind of removed from these other mechanisms that we looked at. So again, uh, this is an old paper, uh, and there, there's another uh, later one that I, you know, uh, talk about here. But it, this physiology journal article was trying to relate, and they, they've got at the bottom of the first uh, bullet there from the Cipro floxacin warning label, nervousness, agitation, insomnia, anxiety, nightmares, and, and or paranoia, uh, suicide, uh, et cetera. So look at this list and remember that actually before we were that worried about people tendons, this was part of what you were supposed to watch uh, for in people that you gave a fluoroquinolone to. And the reason is that the FQs actually downgrade GABA-A receptors. Remember GABA-A receptors, that's the one that uh, the benzodiazepine and the non-benzosleepase and uh, barbiturates and alcohol, that, but they all go to GABA-A, right? So if we downregulate them, <coughs> which 
you you know that they're already the hardest receptors to get back once they're down regulated um, you wind up with all of these hyper GABA symptoms and they include all of these things use tremors hallucination depression you know psychotic reactions etc and the point I would like to make with this is a this is not new information at all if you look at the citation um, but what I have seen over time as we get some of the patients who have fluoroquinolone toxicity and they've gotten no help at all for it, um, they get more and more and more neuropsychiatric activation and they're very difficult to deal with. And it's a real thing. And it's not just that they're being, uh, you know, over worried about their health. And it's not just that, you know, they're, um, having psychosomatic problems, they are truly now neurologically injured. And so when we're thinking about this, we want to remember that a piece of the management of this patient is not just that they probably have fatigue and they hurt, uh, but there's a lot of bad stuff going on inside their brain that they're not, um, you know, th this, is, this is usually not normal for them. Now, again, just like the reactive oxygen mechanism and people who are moving toxic metals around, that's kind of double double whammy there. Well, what about people who've already screwed up their GABA-A receptors because they've been on benzos a long time or they're alcoholics or they're on uh, the non-benzo GABA sleep aids or whatever. This is another kind of perfect storm when you put fluoroquinolones into the mix. Um, so the other thing that's interesting is um, that in the, I think this is, yeah, there you go, in the second bullet, um, in the presence of an anti-inflammatory agent, quinolone antibiotics decrease affinity of GABA-A receptors, and you can uh, have epileptogenic, uh, so seizurogenic neurotoxicity. And this is another thing that, that actually has been seen in people. And this is from that paper. Uh, this is actually from a newer paper. That's right, uh, in Pharmacology Weekly, 2009. And uh, so they're showing, you know, GABA A as a chloride uh, channel, and the uh, fluoroquinolones downregulated um, to below 70 millivolts. And if you add fluoroquinolones and NSAIDs together, it goes even lower. Uh, so essentially, then um, remember that GABA A's, if you you know, if you suddenly withdraw GABA or uh, effect, you're going to have seizures. So that's another thing. We've actually seen this with some of our more severe patients where uh, during treatment or in the lead up to diagnosis or whatever, they'll have either seizure-like activity or remember that uh, what we used to call in pharmacology an, uh, an affective seizure, uh, a, a seizure of you know, your uh, neuromotional behavior, so you don't get a musculoskeletal seizure, uh, but you get mania or uh, hypomania or, as it said, hallucinations, et cetera. So anything can uh, emanate from this effect as well. This is, as I said, the people I've dealt with who've had the worst problems with oral clones, the neuroemotional psychiatric part has been probably the worst to deal with. And we're going to circle back around to it in a little bit here. But one of the things that you see with people who have had fluoroquinolone uh, poisoning is they will have such trouble with their GABA receptor complex. Now, of course, they don't come in usually unless they're psychiatrists. So they have my GABA receptor complex is messed up. But they will come in and they'll be so anxious and they'll be so fearful because the GABA receptors aren't working and they're having all these weird discharges in their brain all the time, um, that um, they often will then be very resistant to your treatment. And so one of the last things I'm going to share with you is just a, uh, a I guess, sort of a, a preemptive handout that we, that we came up with for people, just letting them know, you know, that this is not something that's, if you're, if you're that bad, is not something that's traditionally easy to treat. It takes time, and you have to engage in a trust relationship with the clinic or the doctor or whoever, uh, or you will you will 
drop out of treatment before you get better. And the reason that they do that is not that they're trying to be troublesome. It's that their brain is literally injured. And uh, I, I cannot overstate enough the level of anxiety and the level of, uh, you know, how when people get very anxious, they often second guess treatment and they, you know, they do all this stuff. And I'll tell some stories about that coming up. But there is a true biological neurotoxic reason for the reason uh, for uh, why people react the way that they do. All right. Well, that's that's now we there, there's many other uh, pathophysiologic rabbit holes, but I think that kind of gives you a flavor of there's a lot more than our original theories were uh, pointing to. And the original theories were all about the DNA gyrates and all of that business, which we knew because that's how it killed so many bugs. Um, and then the theory went on that, well, let's take the, the least uh, uh, least healing tissue in the body, cartilage connected tissue, and then uh, let's slow its DNA turnover down and, and yeah, we get, we get trouble there. But then you've got this whole thing about it being a chelator, and then you've got this whole thing about it being a reactive oxygen generator, and then you've got this whole thing about GABA receptors. And remember, GABA receptors are huge in the brain, but they're also huge in the digestive tract and in uh, the manipulation of digestive function. We've talked about in other uh, types of stuff. So what have been the therapies? Now, here's... Uh, Here's where the therapeutics discussion is going to come from. I have treated a large number of people with fluoroquinolone injury. Thankfully, none of them that I created. Um, but that being said, uh, there is a spectrum like with anything else. So it's just like, you know, there's some Epstein-Barr patients that you can get better really easy, and there are some that you don't get better really easy. And then there's some that never seem to get better. They had the same spectrum for your uh, fluoroquinolone people. <clears throat> so as we go through these therapeutics, what I want you to know is that these are the therapeutics that not only have data behind them, but also make logical sense or physiologic sense. But the other thing is these are things that I've tried and experimented with on people over time. And uh, this is sort of the group that has worked the best. So you know, something to consider. So I started to so-called collect patients with fluoroquinolone related connective tissue and other injuries. And the bottom line is that the treatment has to go beyond the microscopic injuries and the tendons and other stuff like that, but you can't leave that out. So it winds up being a treatment that by the time the patient comes to you and says, I have fluoroquinolone injury, and I've had, you know, three doctors try and treat it, and it's you know, not working, you've got to back up and you have to be excruciatingly uh, well-rounded in your uh, approach. That's the first thing that I can say. Now, the first thing that you have to think about is the damage to the mitochondria. And think about it this way. If, if if the fluoroquinolone, beyond, beyond the DNA part, okay, let's just take a couple of the other pathophysiologic things that we talked about a few minutes ago. If we take the idea that the fluoroquinolone is going to be able to chelate important intermediate nutrients, such as magnesium or calcium, well, that's going to change the charge on a lot of things. That's going to have a direct effect on the mitochondria. And then we have the fluoroquinolone in the presence of, uh, of, of metals, both nutrient metals and toxic metals, but even just nutrient metals in your body as a reactive oxygen generator. It's no wonder we have cell damage. It's no wonder we have uh, mitochondrial damage. So that's where you really got to think when you're going for trying to treat the person from the inside out. You don't get more inside than the mitochondria. And this is just sort of a, you know, kind of a, a spectrum here, but there have been cases where, you know, it's taken a couple IVs a week plus supportive oral therapies for three to five months before we got anywhere. And then there are some that took less effort and started to resolve in a month or two. 
And one of the things that just in the clinical management of the patient that you have to talk to them about is it's it's not always clear from the beginning, you know, which uh, injured person is going to be, you know, a quick resolver or a long resolver. What I can say is that the more things that you can bring to bear on the case, the more of these areas where you can kind of remove troubles, et cetera, um, then the the quicker it will respond. But quick is, is, is super, super relative. So we're going to look at supportive therapies. We're going to look at direct therapies. And uh, I have high hopes for you. Now, on the connected tissue uh, front itself, Clinical Nutrition Insights, Mark Percival has written a whole bunch of clinical nutrition articles. If you haven't ever seen any of Mark's work, it's pretty good. This is a really, and I, I know it's dated 1997. Yes, we still knew stuff in 1997, so don't, don't hate. Um, this is actually a pretty good overview, and, and there's some stuff that's maybe changed a little bit because we know a little bit more, and I'm going to share that. But the, the Mark's article, and you can get this free, it's Google uh, Clinical Nutrition Insight, first of all, connected tissue, and you'll get the, uh, this, this baby here. And it goes into, you know, why and stuff. Now, I've shared before, um, and I didn't put a picture of it in. Uh, I could have, but I have done it before. But if you go to uh, the pain practitioner um, journal, so pain practitioner, and you look up um, my name, for example, and uh, naturopathic stem cell support, uh, Dr. Harry Adelson and myself and um, Moore wrote the first part of a two-part series of articles about stem cells and naturopathic support. And in that particular uh, journal, when they published it, we, we updated uh, a lot of this information looking at, because in 97, we were really doing a lot of stem cell work. Uh, but that that periodical would be probably the next, uh, the next update. It's pain practitioner. Uh, and just put my my name and stem cells in, and you'll find it. So you do, whatever you do, you have to start with mitochondrial repair and beyond connective tissue nutrient support. So obviously, if the person comes in and they have uh, tendinoses or, or they've had a rupture of a tendon or they've just got pain, you know, a lot of it, especially in the elderly folks, they would just, they would just hurt all over. They wouldn't have specific pain. They would just hurt. It was like a it was like a sudden onset fibromyalgia. Uh, so obviously you're going to be dealing with connective tissue and nutrient support. But then you got to back up and say, okay, what, what's going to be most helpful for the mitochondria? And so we think about our basics. We'll get in deeper into some of these things. But carnitine, CoQ10. Uh, remember, carnitine is there to help uh, the fatty acids get inside the mitochondria uh, so they can go through beta oxidation get energy and all that. CoQ10, obviously, huge. It's, a, it's an intermediate in, your, in, in the respiratory chain. Um, MCT oil, so medium chain triglycerides, a lot of that is uh, just you know, easier feeding. Scorbate and glutathione we'll talk about. Um, iron if deficient. Now, yeah, the fluoroquinolones have this nasty habit of chelating and also making reactive oxygen. Uh, so we don't want a ton of iron around, but what we found, because uh, so there's there's a ubiquinone step in the oxfos chain in the mitochondria, super important. There's two iron steps. So if your patient's ferritin is three, uh, and they have mitochondrial problems, the mitochondria will never repair until you get the you know the ferritin. Duh. And then thyroid status, because the thyroid are the operator of the mitochondrial set point, uh, and so. Again, if you have somebody with a thyroid comorbidity, and then because of the stress, maybe their adrenals go off and their reverse T3 goes up and all that business, and you don't fix the thyroid, it's just like not fixing uh, you know, a low iron, the mitochondria don't have a chance. Okay, So you've you got to put the nutrients in, but you've got to think about who operates the mitochondria elsewhere. The other thing uh, that's really good, so it's, of course, it's good for everything, right? But but when it comes to detoxing the cells, curcumin, and uh, we're uh, we are in our chelation classes and our detox classes, 
we are incorporating more and more and more curcumin in uh, to detox with people because curcumin is one of the few things that can actually go into a cell and remove metals and other junk. It's also one of the few things that can go in the brain and the, the CNS and remove metals. Uh, it's, it is unique almost in that respect. So curcumin is, is a huge help. And of course we think of it, okay, they're in pain, the curcumin would be helpful, but it's also a big, 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 uh, detox support, and then we'll look at some other specific nutrients below. Now, I have no financial connection to lipoic mineral complex or poly MBA, but um, it has been the one singular thing that I have seen across the board be the most helpful, in, especially in these cases, largely because being made out of a polymer of lipoic acids, uh, plural, and then other nutrients covalently bonded in, it goes right into the mitochondria. And there's actually research to support this, and NASA is now using it for radiation protection. I mean, it's a pretty interesting molecule. Um, so this is something that, uh, yes, it's got a bit of you know cost. It's not the most expensive thing I've ever used. Uh, but it's it's something that you can use on a first strike, and I give some oral and IV types of doses down below. What I would say is is that it is the kind of thing where, and and this goes for any mitochondrial support, etc. Um, if someone has really damaged mitochondria and you make them work really quickly, um, and we see this with giving people. T3 thyroid hormone or whatever, if their body's not ready for the mitochondria to work, it's like you're making a sick organ uh, organelle work faster than it has the capacity to. And LAMC has the ability to do that because it directly goes to the mitochondria and starts uh, to actually increase the respiratory chain activity. And again, they this has actually been studied quite a bit. So. You want to start low and work up with these folks. And, and if you've done any classes where I talk about this, this is always the one where under normal circumstances, a healthy person can take a max dose um, and uh, get, you know, pretty uh, – you know, get, get a good effect from it and not have any overstimulation or anything like that. But sick people, because your mitochondria are also sick, you've got to start low and work up. And I think, let me just make sure I read this whole question. So I didn't miss something. Uh, what about NAD IV for mitochondrial support? Yeah, later. It's it it's probably one one hundred the value of this uh, of using poly MBA because the poly MBA is actually going to go in. And it's actually going to change the kinetics of the entire mitochondrial respiratory complex. NAD is a really good substrate, and you'll see that we talk about that coming up in a minute. But it's a, it's like CoQ10. It's a single, you know, maybe two-point uh, manipulator. This actually changes the electrodynamics uh, of the entire mitochondria. So that's why I'm starting with this. All right. This is an interesting, this is a case report uh, by a few doctors, uh, and you can get this from 2012. It's at this URL here. You get it free. And it's talking about a patient that they treated. And here's the thing. They presented with low back pain, and they realized it was for pineal toxicity. And the thing uh, that the reason I'm throwing that at well, number one, it's a published case report. Uh, but they did a, a pretty well-rounded approach. And so they, they did an IV approach that I'm going to pitch to you as one thing you can do if you're doing IVs. And it included, you know, the use of glutathione support and glutathione and poly and all this other stuff. And you got to think of it as you got you got to kind of repair things as you're detoxing the patient because those two things are going on at the same time. Now, if they have comorbid, you know, 
ruptured tendons and stuff, you're also working on that. But it's really where you go. You have to go to rehab the mitochondria or all the rest of the treatments just don't work. So that's a really nice one. Um, and these are some of the mitochondrial references for volume D. There's, there's a lot more to dig up there. They're in my book if you want them. Uh, hyperbaric, super duper, duper helpful. Um, and the re reason is that if you recall the, the dynamics of oxygen when it comes to um, normal movement, you have, you know, at your, your vascular delivery side, so at the arterial side of the, of the capillaries, you have like 99% uh, PO2. And then you get into the side all of your cell and it's only a 23 PO2. So remember that uh, gases move across membranes without transport as they move by the, their partial pressures. And so if you go from a 99 on the outside cell to 23 on the inside, it's, it's just like super highway of oxygen. But then you remember that, that the mitochondria only have PO2 about five and that's where the oxygen is mostly used. So if you look at that gradient, the pressure gradient to get oxygen in, it is just, you know, the mitochondria are just waiting for oxygen because they run on. So you start to support uh, the mitochondria. If you can get your patient to do some hyperbaric therapy, that is very, very synergistic because it gets the body not only in the mode, With oxygen, so that that gradient is even higher, and the mitochondria are fed. But what else does it do? When you go and you push O2 in to the mitochondria, you naturally clean out the carbon dioxide because it has to efflux out of the cell as soon as the PO2 rises on the cytosol in the mitochondria. You have to have efflux of CO2 on the way out. And that's exactly what happens. So if possible, hyperbaric is super, super helpful. Now, having said that, uh, I think on the next slide, we tend to use lower pressures and shorter times in the beginning. And as you see in bullet point number two, if it's an average patient one or two weeks into therapy, we'll start to do HBOT. If it's a really super sick patient, they're all freaked out and all that, we might wait four or more weeks. Why? Because the HBOT is gonna be pushing this oxygen gradient, which is great, moving the CO2 out, but if the mitochondria are not strong enough to accept that, then the patient will have reactions. Now, they'll have reactions anyway, which is why we go at lower pressure at a shorter time, and then we work it up, and we also build up the mitochondria first. That's the big thing. And whether you're doing oral-only therapies or oral and IV therapies or whatever, you're doing, make sure that they're doing their stuff and they're taking what they need to take and make sure they, you know, they're not reacting to it all that stuff before you start HBOT. And if you do Oral therapies, it's pretty simple. You just have one of the oral therapy and then make your H bot, whatever you your H bot. Um, what I would say is to start with one H bot a week at a low pressure, short time. Look at tolerance one or two times a week. And, and that's probably about as much as you really want to do with these guys until they start to heal a lot more. More on the tendon cartilage connective tissue side, but this is something that we noticed a long, long ago uh, doing you know, prolotherapy in the, in the older style and all this other stuff before we had PRP and before anything else. Testosterone uh, 
has a direct effect on tendinopathies. Um, and what we've noticed and found in the research, you know, since then, is that if testosterone is low at all, male or female, the healing of connective tissue slows down even more. So in the end, when we do our summary, I'm going to recommend that you uh, are checking hormones and the reason one of the reasons for that is if the person is an estrogen dominant whether a male or a female they have testosterone and then they get fluoroquinolone toxicity they're more likely to get connective tissue problems and they are less likely to heal so that's a very very important thing and i'll kind of circle back around to that but i just want to plant the seed right now that uh, testosterone is an important marker in these folks male or female now, obviously, both because of the chelation effect and because of the ROS effect and just because we use trace elements and some of these bigger minerals in our, our uh, connective tissue repair and mitochondria, we got to think about these things. Now, short term, what I would propose is, uh, you know, it's a, a good multi-mineral that, you know, hopefully they still got some gut effect. They can absorb it. Uh, if not, um, multi-mineral IVs are very, very useful along with other nutrients and stuff. But there's there's a zillion reasons why minerals, uh, big, big minerals and trace elements are important. Uh, and you can probably figure all of them out. But this is something not to leave out of the treatment program. Um, B vitamin status this is another thing I learned, not really the hard way, but just over time. B vitamin status, and this is a clinical determination. But once we started to do B vitamin status as dictated by methyl cycle defects and all that other stuff, it really made a huge huge difference. And the other thing is in the super anxious people, people um, that, you know, are just really hard to deal with, you want to look at not just their B vitamin status and the SNPs and the methyl cycle, et cetera, but you want to look at the uh, excretory pathways. And so you want to be looking at um, C1, D, and MAO and all, all of that because If if they have a backup there, then you know well, all the bad stuff that the porphenolins do to the GABA complex is just it's quadruple trouble all at the same time. Uh, vitamin K, we're going to talk about in a little bit, but one of the things that is, as I say, off ignored uh, is vitamin K and how, how important vitamin K is. for the movement, especially of calcium and other bigger minerals in and out of the connective tissue. And then vitamin A and D, of course, are, are excruciatingly important as well. So don't leave out your fat solubles along with the B vitamins. Specifically with vitamin K, you want to kind of go back. Remember, in addition to clotting, um, Vitamin K supports uh, osteocalcin and matrix proteins and protein S and all this stuff. This is the way to think about vitamin K with respect to connective tissue and bones. It keeps the calcium moving from connective tissue to the bone and not stopping. One of the signs of vitamin K deficiency is calcium that stays in the soft tissues and doesn't get into bone soft tissue calcification. And especially if you got somebody and they you know maybe on their own they read about on you know the internet or they went to a practitioner 
they say, oh my God, your vitamin D is low. And so they put them on vitamin D to replete them. And they never, you know, gave them vitamin K to balance it, a little bit of vitamin A. Um, they're going to wind up with a lot of calcium uh, moving because of the vitamin D. But if they're low in vitamin K, the calcium will move to the right compartment. And that is done through um, enzyme and matrix protein manipulation, which is what vitamin K does in the connective tissue of the bone. That's why it's so important there. So glutathione, and as I say here, we use IV glutathione in every single case of fluoroquinolone toxicity. We start low and work up. If you don't do IVs and give them liposomal glutathione, you can use ALA and NAC. Uh, if they have glutathione synthetase problems, um, ALA and NAC is going to not work quite as well. Uh, specifically, K2 with vitamin D. Yeah, our our default is uh, K2 and vitamin D with almost every use. Uh, we don't use K1 very much, and K3 is very, very specific for particular pharmacology that uh, doesn't involve this problem. So K2, yes, you are correct, number 14. Um, the other thing, and I, I put some references below, you know, look at it, but the, the bottom, bottom line is that in addition to being antioxidant, there's probably uh, a role that glutathione plays in connective tissue detox and development. So, you know, it's like everything else, it's it, they, they all have a little piece to the puzzle. And then vitamin C, well, I mean, we always think of vitamin C as far as, you know, connective tissue health. And you know, scurvy that breaks down. I mean, that that basic. Um, so there's all sorts of reasons why vitamin C is important. But here's you know, here's the other thing. Um, yes, for connective tissue troubles and a, all of that stuff, super duper important to have enough vitamin C around. When you get to other things, though. Uh, such as mitochondrial uh, antioxidant status, glutathione support, uh, protecting iron from oxidizing, and all sorts of other stuff. Vitamin C becomes very important. So it's cheap and it's easy, and a lot of times in treatment protocols, you see people getting. Uh, rightfully so, you know, some expensive stuff like liposomal like glutathione and some poly MBA and a bunch of nutrients. And they may not be getting any vitamin C. Vitamin C has got to be kind of one of those foundational things, kind of like the minerals, et cetera. Um, so, oral dosing, you know, start low. And work up to bowel tolerance if they really need that much, but at least at least a few grams a day for most people. Now, what we have found over the years, and hence bullet point number two, I don't recommend high dose IV vitamin C. Usually, we do lower doses, like two to ten grams in a general nutrient IV. If it's oral. It's all low dose, so you don't have to worry about that. But if it's uh, if it's high dose, you start to get uh, pro oxidation, and the last thing that these people need is a pro oxidant activity, especially in synergy with all the other stuff. So you want to really think of the vitamin C as low dose antioxidant dosing, just protective background stuff. Uh, not you don't want to get. Trust me, I've done it. don't want to give these people 50, 75 grams of you know, vitamin C. Um, 
uh, until like they heal up and then they have some other problem. But, now there's a plethora of amino acids that are required uh, for everything. If we look at the connective tissue repair and recovery, that is a huge area for amino acid use. Uh, so proline, lysine, carnitine, taurine, all, you know, all the all the good uh, ones. But the other thing to keep in mind is that when we look at the respiratory chain in the mitochondria. There's a lot of amino acid activity in there, especially uh, proline, actually, is one of those things that's used as, uh, as a, uh, a very poor part of the mitochondrial complex. So rather than giving a la carte, I mean, now you can give the a la carte ones in, in an IV formula, and a lot of times you see these as an IV formula, but a, when you're talking about amino acid supplementation, um, you know, start with the basics. Have them on a good multi-mineral that's got trace elements. Have them on a good um, broad-based amino acid supplement. Um, you know, have them on mitochondrial primers uh, and protect things like the glutathione, vitamin C thing, polyamine. And all the, all those goodies, and, and then kind of build your way out from there. That way, they're getting the base nutrition that's been screwed over by the rest of the process. Now, there's other therapies that that we've started to use, you know, more recently. I mean, most of these things I'm talking about go back 10 plus years, uh, some of these are a little bit newer. Um, UVBI, if you're doing that, ultraviolet blood irradiation um, is one possible treatment you can try with people. And then there's uh, laser therapy, it's something we're doing more and more uh, uh, in in our clinic and working with clinics in other parts of the world on. Um, and one of the nice things is if you get one of the laser systems that has the modulation to it, different lights and all that stuff. Um, you can actually have different effects on the mitochondria and I am not going to Uh, go de uh, go deeply into that. It's called low level uh, laser therapy (LLT). Um, or photodynamic therapy. Uh, there's a lot, lot of uh, you know really forward thinking stuff. Mostly from Europe that's going on with this and uh, this. This is one area where uh, laser therapy can be incorporated. Uh, that is my wrist and an LLT device uh, that uh, um, I was trying for uh, some some pain that I had developed um, and. Uh, I, I was really kind of dubious about this. It's kind of and, uh, it really kind of surprised me um, about that. Now, I don't have a picture of it, but now we also uh, thread laser catheters into people's veins, light those up, and then uh, that's actually you can see some really amazing shifts with people. It's sort of like, like you see with HBOT almost with folks. If you do want to look at like just a clinical book on photodynamic therapy, 
Dr. Weber uh, has this one that you can get from uh, that research group down there. So on the clinical side of things, just some things to consider uh, as, as we go into thinking about a few things. The first thing is go slow. Um, I was speaking to a doctor recently, and they were talking about you know, something kind of related to what we're talking about here. Progression of treatment. I said, "Well, you know, are you taking it slow and easy because the patient's reacting and all this?" And, oh yeah, yeah, I'm going slow. And I said, well, how far between uh, therapeutic adjustments as far as doses, you know, how far are you, are you allowing? And uh, they said, well, seven days. I said, well, that's how your patients react. It's too fast. Uh, in people who are more on the really damaged end of the spectrum, especially if they come in and they're pretty clear that it was chloroquine wounds and or or they've been somewhere and died diagnosed with it. They've just they've had these train wreck experiences. Those people you've got to sit them down. I don't know, like I said, I'll show you our handout, but you gotta sit them down and say, look, Uh, you might think you were going really at a slow pace with your treatment before, but we're going to go at a slower pace because you've been reacting to your treatment. That's how you know you've got to slow down when the patient starts reacting. You also have to factor in this it is hugely significant mental emotional component. Now, another way that I use to tell if uh, somebody is not having a mental emotional component is, um, you know, history. You can talk to them, but also... Um, if they're pretty compliant and they're pretty, you know, pretty on top of it, and, you know, they're not having big sleep disruption or anxiety or all this stuff, then you probably got somebody that the GABA receptor didn't get too messed up or, or there wasn't a lot of collaborative GABA uh, destruction. Um, <clears throat> and the reason that I say this is some of the, you know, again, more learning the hard way, some of the patients that we had the worst time with were people that we didn't realize the depth of the mental, emotional, psychiatric component. And remember, it's not in their head. Well, it is, but it's biological. They have literally damaged their GABA-A complex with the fluoroquinolone, so they can't help it. But think about it. What do people with GABA-A damage turn into? they turn into the most anxious, non-compliant patients that you can have. And they will come in, you know, with 11 million reasons why they haven't done anything that you said. And it's because they're so anxious about their health and what's going on. They're so anxious that you're going to do the wrong thing or they're not going to get better or whatever. So it's like it takes a bad situation and multiplies it times a thousand in some of these. So you've got to sit them down in front end and say, uh, you know, we're going to go slow and we're going to build things up, and you're going to feel better slowly. But this is going to be, uh, this is going to be a tough nut to crack. And and if it gets real bad, you may need to work with a psychiatric prescriber to help them kind of in the bridge, uh, because if they are so anxious and their GABA receptors are so screwed up that they are second-guessing themselves and you and everybody else, they'll never do anything. Or they'll try one treatment one time, and if anything goes wrong at all, they'll think you're an idiot, and, and they'll, they'll stop doing everything that you told them. And, uh, and this, this happens. Now, in the easier cases where the people get better quickly, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the people who come in and say, yeah, I was diagnosed with chloroquinolone toxicity. I've got all these problems. 
and I've been to four different doctors, and I hope you can help me because no one else has helped me. Those people are the ones I'm talking about. Now, if it's a bad case, not only are they going to have the GABA receptor mental emotional component, but they will flare up from something that you do. And so you just got to tell them up front, look, um, it's not it's not if you're going to flare. It's when and from what. So eyeball to eyeball, you have to make an agreement with me that we're, we on the clinical side are going to go slow. We're going to do everything, you know, in, in order, et cetera. But when you flare, you have to understand that that's part of the process. And we are going to adjust our treatment based on whatever it is that made you flare. And they have to understand that whatever made them flare is not bad for them. It is that their body is doing, it's the wrong logic that is being processed through the system. So, you know, I would tell them, you know, your, your body right now, one and one doesn't equal two anymore. One and one equals the square root of 700. It's, it, it's just not working for you. So your body's going to do different things with some of the stuff we give you. We won't know until we do. But we're going to start low and work up, blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> and as you know, but uh, if you've forgotten, good, to, good time to remember with these people. Um, if you tell people ahead of time, look, it's not if, it's when you flare, and it's, it's what we do with it. Then when they flare, uh, they'll come in and say, tell me about that again and tell me how you're going to fix this. <laughs> uh, you know, as opposed to, oh, man, you know, I did that. I did that first time of their treatment. You know, I felt better, and then the next day I was really, really sick and blah, blah, so that must be bad for me. Or I did the first glutathione ID, and I got really, really sick, and I, I, you got to be crazy to give me that stuff or whatever. Uh, that happens. <clears throat> now, comorbidities, I'm going to circle around to in a couple of slides. Big ones, certain the genomic area, endocrine, blood-brain barrier, neuro stuff, it's always screwed up infections. Um, and then other things to consider along the way, uh, lotus naltrexone, cannabinoids. Um, you know, in some of the most acute cases, I had the best success when the brain was just on fire. And, you know, they were really hard to deal with and all that uh, using cannabinoids. Uh, and, you know, we've got a webinar all about cannabinoids, how to mix and match. But um, that was probably some of the most helpful stuff. Now, if you're in a state where they can get you know, THC and CBD, the cliff note version of that is we give them CBD through the day and some THC at night. And if you want dosing and all that stuff, go listen to that webinar again because I don't have time for that here. Uh, but if you're in a state where all you can get is CBD, CBD is still incredibly helpful. And again, go to the cannabinoid lecture, LDN, go to the LDN lecture and look at that. It's worth it. What I would say with LDN, just as sort of a footnote, because we didn't really talk about chloroquinolone toxicity in the LDN uh, lecture, but we did talk about sensitive people. There are people who will have good reactions to low-dose naltrexone at a half milligram or one milligram, and one and a half or two, and then they start to get weird reactions at one and a half or two or three or whatever. So you don't have to go to 4.5. Uh, what you want to do with these these folks is these would be people I'd put on like a half milligram per month or one milligram maybe and kind of work them forward. But the LDN can be helpful. Again, lots of mechanistic reasons, but uh, that's all in the LDN class. I can't think of a much more poster child uh, of a situation for holistic thinking and healing than fluoroquinolone toxicity in a patient that's got it really bad. Now, again, just like with a Lyme patient or Epstein-Barr patient, if they get better with a few a few interventions, great, do it. Uh, but if they're not or if they come to you and say, man, the last three doctors really screwed me over, uh, I hope you can help me. These people need everything. This is, this is not an option. Okay, And so uh, we talked about before coin this Anderson 8, if you like, uh, because of eight areas to look at when things are screwed up, cell function. Remember, cell function includes the mitochondria and organelles and micronutrients, blah, blah, blah. Toxic stuff, definitely a big player here. Biofilms and other infectious resistant agents. If you think about it, often the reason that somebody is given a fluoroquinolone is because they had a bad infection. 
uh, because it's super broad spectrum, et cetera. So a lot of times these people's infectious, uh, whether it's their digestive biome getting screwed up by the chloroquinone or uh, their, uh, their uh, systemic issues, it's, it's probably related in some way to the reason they got the prescription in the first place. And then if they were on it for a while, you know that they're out of balance. So there's going to be some resistance factors and immune things. The other thing is, in the immunologic area, if somebody, ha you know, they're just not getting better and you're doctor number two or six or whatever, uh, and no one's looked at chronic infections, no one's looked at checked them for autoimmunity, uh, et cetera, no one's checked them for IgGs uh, uh, or immune globulins and T cells and stuff, please do, because I, I've had that be the problem. Endocrine is just super crazy important, psych neuro, super important. Digestive function on one end or the other of treatment has got to be repaired. Uh, and then physical and structural things will definitely, because normally they have either musculoskeletal pain or specific pain uh, in an area. And so uh, for those who haven't seen it or if you've forgotten, you know, these, these are just, you know, over the last 300 years, uh, these, these are the things I've seen in my patients that have been the most uh, negatively affecting on cases. And so when you're thinking of holism, of course, we think of we want everything to work correctly. These are the eight kind of areas of the body which were in that list before, uh, or areas of disease that are the biggest impediments to cure. And so when the case is stalling out or they're getting reactions or whatever, uh, these are the things that I back up to and kind of look at and, and say, am, am I not treating something on here? Did I not assess something? And, you know, there's a little deeper look into it here. Then, of course, we have the whole webinar on all this. So in my clinical experience, these are the areas that I look for in fluoroquinone toxicity on, you know, both from a macro point of view on a, on a patient that might be an easier case, but definitely on the harder cases. You always want to check into their adrenal function thyroid, including reverse T3 and antibodies, the whole, the whole deal. Uh, their androgens, uh, so, you know, get a good androgen workup. Definitely female, get a free testosterone because uh, otherwise you won't find any. Uh, but a lot of the women that I've seen, they, you know, they, they, they've become estrogen dominant because of the inflammation. They have zero androgen that we can find, and their progesterone is low but in the face of all that estrogen. So go back, and if you don't recall, go back to some of the neuro uh, webinars. But remember estrogen progesterone balance, not only peripherally because it affects the androgen and the connective tissue turnover in the mitochondria, but in the brain and with uh, brain healing and inflammation, if the person, whether male or female, has high estrogen, low progesterone, what else is it gonna aggravate? going to aggravate that GABA receptor problem because remember that progesterone and pregnenolone are GABA-A agonists. They, they upregulate uh, GABA-A and what does fluoroquinolone do it down there? So, so they already have estrogen dominant, low androgen in, in normal or low progesterone, that, that aggravates this nervous system hyperirritability, et cetera. So you've got to look at the whole picture uh, uh, in the endocrine world. Um, Metals, and it just assume chemicals. So people say, well, you know, I had chemical uh, exposure before I was, uh, you had the fluoroquinolones. Well, no shit, yeah. But now you have mitochondria that aren't working and a brain that doesn't work and everything else. So you're, the chemicals that you had that you may not have been noticing, uh, you're going to notice them. And, uh, it, you know, so you don't want to start heavy-duty detox, you know, right in the beginning until they're a little more stable, but you need to know and they need to know the depurative things such as, you know, short bursts in the sauna and, you know, drinking a lot of water and eating a lot of fiber and all that stuff. Very, very important. Metals, you know, look at the toxic metal um, webinar, but metals are super duper important uh, to check. So do, do some testing there. Uh, their brains are super inflamed, so you got to think about healing the blood-brain barrier. You got to think about the GABA complex. You got to think about all that stuff that we 
talked about, but this is like a, a this is a ubiquitous problem, but it gets very aggressive and it can cause. Um, this is why these people will wind up in the hospital with seizures and other stuff like that because of that um, pathophysiology we talked about earlier. Physical structural stuff, you know, sometimes they'll be very tolerant of physical medicine, sometimes they won't. You want to think about stretching. Uh, you want to think about uh, manual therapies and massage and uh, acupuncture and other stuff that, that they can do. But just like with the other therapies, start really easy and slow because if the mitochondria and the muscles are damaged to any degree, that, that can be a problem. Uh, GI, as I said, you know, if they have over digestive symptoms, do some testing. If their GI system seems okay and maybe they didn't have a lot of antibiotics or whatever, just kind of feel your way through that. And do, you know, at, at least do some probiotics and stuff. But you just got to, if, if it's a case that's not getting better, you've got to check their gut. And then the infectious disease stuff, uh, I, I don't check that in people who are getting better on mitochondrial support and that sort of stuff. But in people that come in and, and you know, they, they have a lot of good stuff, but they're not getting anywhere back up and make sure that they don't have some chronic infections because a lot of times they do. And that's just, it, it's just like checking for autoimmunity and other stuff. You don't want the fire burning the entire time. Now, I will not read this to you because you probably fall asleep, but uh, this, this is just a patient handout you can throw away or you can use or think about or whatever. Um, and this is um, ours, so of course it has my name in it. So if you're going to reuse it, unless your name actually is Dr. Anderson, you might want to take and put your name in or say, you know, this guy, he's got some issues, but he seems to know stuff, so I'm going to use his. Um, and the reason that I start with this is people need to know that this is not uh, this is this is not a single therapy. They want it to be, but it's not. It's exactly the same logic as your patient who says they have chronic Lyme or chronic whatever. That's 11 million different things. And so there's there's going to be you know at least 10 million different therapeutic uh, protocols. And when these people's brains are inflamed, they don't want to hear that. But if you don't tell them this stuff up front, and then they start longer than they can get up to. Being very difficult conversations kind of get back on track. We let them know that uh, you know we we've, we've got to look at labs and we've got to do all this other stuff and genomics maybe and other stuff and some of it might be covered and some may not be by your health insurance. So you need to understand that. Um, I added this section because we you know, once we started to see a few of these patients and we had people calling from. You know other states and everything, and their, um, you know, their family is is pissed off. They can't get better, and you know, they they want an answer for exactly how many treatments and how much it's going to cost. All and they just there's not an answer for that. Um, and and I would rather you not start working with me um, <laughs> than start working with me under you know false pretenses that where I uh, didn't communicate well. About. And this just kind of goes through, okay, well, what are you going to do your first visit, your second visit, blah, 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 stuff. Um, and then this just talks about the uh, the spectrum. Some people have simpler case. Some people have a harder case. And then it, in, in the third uh, paragraph there, they said, you know, or, or, well, I said, um, many people have a better, worse, better cycle for quite a long time. That is, you're, you're on a high because you're getting better, and then you your body readjusts, and then you have the healing reaction, so it seems like you get worse. You're not really worse, but it seems like it. So then you're mad at the doctor, and then you adjust therapy, and then you get better. Uh, it, it just follows that way. It's exactly like you say, the same as a chronic infection patient. Uh, it's just, just a little bit more dicey. All right, so I uh, for those who weren't here on the beginning of the call, uh, starting in January, so all three of these so far we've done this year, we're having accredited by AAMP for uh, CE accreditation, and uh, there's a certificate on the next to the last slide. The last slide says thank you, I do thank you. Um, but the next last slide will, will tell you 
the number of hours and how much pharmacology that is. Uh, and that'll be right there on the certificate. You should print that out uh, so you have a, a, a record of it. And, uh, you know, if you're in a looser state, like the state of Washington, they, they, they don't need this, but Arizona, California, Hawaii, many states do require a AMP or somebody to certify. And as I mentioned, if you're in the state of Oregon, uh, currently I don't believe Oregon accepts a AMP credit, but we are working with the Oregon Board. We've always done work with the Oregon Board, but we're going to keep trying dual uh, accreditation there for our Oregon people. Um, the other thing is check your state rules because lots of people listen to these on the recorded side, and that's cool and great. And if it's ANP accredited, we're getting them accredited, whether it's recorded or live. But your state might make a distinction. So like California, I think it's